In this lecture, we'll talk about systems of two qubits. These uh, quantum systems exhibit a remarkable property called entanglement. And um, this property of entanglement plays a critical role in quantum computation. So in this and the next couple of lectures, we'll try to get an intuition for, for entanglement and what this property is all about. But before we do that, in this video, I want to formalize what we spoke about last time uh, about qubits and superpositions. Okay, so let's get started. So recall that um, the energy of an electron in an atom is quantized. What this means is that the electron cannot take on any arbitrary, arbitrary energy, but the energy must be one of you know, it must be in one of a discrete number of energy levels. So now imagine that we've, li we've limited the energy of the electron so that it's in the ground state or the first excited state and so on up through the K minus first excited state. So if this electron were, were a classical system, then it could store one of K bits of information, K pieces of information, which we might denote by 0, 1, through k minus 1. Now the superposition principle, which is one of the basic axioms of quantum mechanics, says that in general the state of the system is, is going to be any linear superposition of these allowable states. So what the superposition principle says is that the general state is, is a linear superposition of 0 through k minus 1, each with its amplitude, um, alpha sub j, which is a complex number. And these amplitudes are normalized so, so that summation alpha j magnitude squared equal to 1 for j equal to 0 to k minus 1. Okay, so as we saw last time, interpreting what this state means is not very easy because it's hard to make sense of what it means when we say the electron is in the ground state with amplitude minus one over two or one over two plus I over two. Okay, so now, of course, one way we can interpret this is by, through the measurement axiom, which says that when we measure the system or when we look at it, then the probability that the outcome is j is the magnitude of alpha j squared. So the fact that the state is normalized means that we get with probability 1, we see some outcome j between 0 and k minus 1. Moreover, we also saw that, the, that a measurement disturbs the system, and the new state, which we'll denote by psi prime, is the jth excited state if the measurement outcome was j. So we can do a quick example. So if k was 3, so we have a 3-state system. We might have our state as 0 with amplitude half plus i over 2, 1 with amplitude minus 1 over 2, 2 with amplitude i over 2. And now if we measure the probability we see zero is a half and the new state is zero. The probability we see one is a quarter. New state is one and the probability we see two is a quarter and the new state would be just get two. Here's a nice cartoon which depicts how, in the world that we are used to, 
what a superposition might look like. A superposition of going, taking the left route around the tree and the right route around the tree. Okay, so, so now let's look at a geometric interpretation of, um, of the quantum state. So geometrically, here's what the superposition principle says. So what it says is that the state of a quantum system, a k-level quantum system, is a unit vector in a k-dimensional complex vector space. Okay, so, so what it says is that state is given by a unit vector in a in a k-dimensional complex vector space, and this vector space is also called a Hilbert space. Okay, so what do we mean by this? So, so we have a k-dimensional complex vector space whose, which has an orthonormal basis consisting of the states ket0, ket1, ket2 through ket k minus 1, and the state psi is a unit vector. And if we write psi as alpha zero zero plus alpha one one plus alpha two get two, we could also have written it as alpha naught, alpha one, alpha two in in vector standard vector notation, where alpha naught, alpha one, alpha two are complex numbers. So it belongs to a three-dimensional complex vector space. We can also talk about what happens when we measure the system. So what happens when we measure is the state vector psi gets projected onto one of the basis states. So if you are measuring in the standard basis 0, 1, 2, then psi gets projected onto the state 0 with probability which is cosine squared of the angle theta zero it makes with, with the state zero. So the probability that the outcome is zero is cosine squared theta zero. And if that's the outcome, then psi is projected onto the zero state. It becomes the zero state. Now, this is true in, in general that um, that the that the state vector is projected onto onto each of the vectors in the orthonormal basis in which we are measuring with probability cosine squared theta where theta is the angle with which, which it makes with that particular vector but how do we de how do we define theta in general so if you are given two different vectors and maybe they are complex vectors how do, de how do we define theta or cosine theta? So remember that the way we define cosine theta, so if you have two vectors, so if you have this vector psi, which is given by alpha naught, alpha one, alpha two, and phi, which is given by beta naught, beta one, beta two, and these are complex numbers, then the way we design, define the cosine of the angle between them is we are the inner product between alpha naught, you know, between psi and phi, which you get by taking the sum of the corresponding products, and if these are complex numbers, then you take convex conjugates of, of one side, so, so the inner product is just alpha naught complex conjugate times beta naught plus alpha one complex conjugate times beta one plus alpha two complex conjugate times beta two which is also given by taking the row vector with complex conjugate of psi and then the column vector phi. And we can define the angle between these two vectors by saying that cosine theta is the absolute value of the inner product. Sorry, and if these are complex numbers, then it's, it's not the absolute value, it's the magnitude of the complex number. Okay, let's, let's work out an example of all this. So let's say that 
we are working in a two-dimensional space. So here's our standard basis, get zero, get one. So we are working with a qubit. This is, these are the, uh, the standard basis states zero and one. These are the states plus and minus that we talked about last time. Plus is an equal superposition of zero and one. Minus is this state, which is one over square root two, zero, minus one over square root two, one. And now let's take in a state psi, which looks like this. It's uh, one half zero plus square root three over two, one. So, so you know that this, you know, plus of course makes a 45 degree angle and what about psi? It makes a 60 degree angle. And so, so the angle between psi and plus is 15 degrees. So if you were measuring psi in the plus minus basis, the probability you would see plus is, of course, cosine squared 15. But how would you work this out as a vector? Well, the, what you would say is that the probability that the outcome of the measurement is plus is just given by the inner product between these two vectors. Okay, so what's the inner product? Well, you can, you can just multiply corresponding coordinates, or you can write it like 1 half square root 3 over 2 times 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. Of course, you, you've got to take this product squared, the magnitude squared, but everything is real, so you just take the square, and that's 1 over 2 square root 2 plus square root 3 over 2 square root 2, whole thing squared, which is 1 plus square root 3 over 2 square root 2 whole squared, which is 1 plus 3 plus 2 times square root 3 over 8, which is um, 2 plus square root 3 over 4. Now, of course, you can work out something similar for probability of minus, but the other way you can do this is, of course, you can realize that probability of plus plus probability of minus is 1, so the probability of minus is just 2 minus square root 3 over 4. Now, let me show you one other way you can do this calculation, which, of course, should give you the same value, but it might be worth doing that... Um, you know this this other calculation because it's just just a uh, just to give you intuition okay so here's what we're going to do what we'll do is we want to measure sign the plus minus basis so what we'll do is we'll first rewrite psi as alpha plus plus beta minus and now once we write it as alpha plus plus beta minus What's the probability of seeing plus when we measure it in the plus minus basis? It's just alpha magnitude square. So how do we rewrite this in the plus minus basis? Well, let's rewrite zero as a linear combination of plus and minus. And you can see here that zero is one over square root two plus, plus one over square root two minus. Well, because if you add plus and minus, one, the one uh, vector cancels, okay, and you get a multiple of zero. Similarly, one is one over square root two plus minus one over square root two minus. So what you can do is write psi as one half zero, which is one over square root two plus plus one over square root two minus plus 3 over 2 minus, which is 1 over square root 2 plus minus 1 over square root 2 minus, which is, we can gather terms now, so we have over 2 square root 2, and then for plus, we get 1 plus square root 3 times plus, and then for minus, we have 
again 2 square root 2 in the, in the denominator and we get 1 minus square root 3. And so, and so if we were to figure out what's the probability that we'll see plus when we do a measurement, we just take the square of this, which is something you'd recognize from, from the previous calculation. So the probability of plus is just the square of this, which is 1 plus 3 plus twice square root 3 over 8, which is what we saw before, which was 2 plus square root 3 over 